Hello everyone. Warm greetings from team Learn from the Legends. I am Dr. V.C. Manoj. Hearty welcome to the 18th webinar in our series and the second one on birth asphyxia and neuroprotection. Today I have great pleasure in welcoming a novel innovator to our series. I happened to hear his talk in one of the NBS webinar series and I must admit I was thoroughly impressed. Friends, let us welcome the faculty for today's lecture, Dr. Gabriel Varane, founder of Protecting Brains and Saving Futures and Medical Director of neuro NICU at Sao Paulo, Brazil. Hearty welcome, Dr. Braz uh, Gabriel. I ha also have great pleasure in welcoming two legends who will be moderating today's session. Dr. Ranjan Pajava, President of NNF India 21, 2021 and Dr. Sandeep Kadam, Senior Consultant from Pune, India. Hearty welcome, sirs. And now, respected delegates, it is my proud privilege to welcome you all for today's session. We are truly humbled by the massive support and participation that you have all shown for our Learn from the Legends webinar series. In fact, we have more than 2,500 attendees from 65 countries who are watching this session live in Zoom or YouTube or who subsequently watch the sessions in our YouTube channel in the next 24 hours. We are so humbled by your presence and thank you so much dear friends for your support. Now, without wasting any more time, may I request the moderators to carry on with today's session. Thank you. Good evening everybody. It is my great pleasure to be here on the occasion of the webinar Learn from the Legend. I should comment, commend the efforts of NNF Kerala and the Neonatology chapter, Manoj and team specifically, for carrying on this webinar series punctually without fail and attracting a vast thousands of uh, delegates to watch the webinar across the world. It is, it's a great uh, achievement. And I must say the webinar itself is slowly becoming a legend. Now, the today's uh, topic is a very fascinating one. At the same time, I'm sure it will be interesting. At the same time, it's very important one. It's using technologies to protect brains in resource limited countries. What can be more relevant to us? We have the technology in India. We have problems with HIE. Even today, 20% of the neonatal deaths are due to HIE. Uh, but, and also, we have a lot of morbidity, which is remaining. So it is very important for us to look after the brains of the living ones and also to minimize the damage to the brain. What Dr. Gabriel has done is in addition to the research which goes on in therapeutic hypothermia and various other uh, aspects of brain damage and brain protection, he has gone one step ahead and he has innovated ideas to monitor the brains and the neuroprotection strategies in a large number of hospitals using modern technology. He's in, uh, in collaboration with Microsoft. He's using artificial uh, in, uh, intelligence and remote and real-time assistance he's providing to all these hospitals. That is really great. He's not only a scientist and a researcher, he's gone one step behind in implementing whatever has come out of that science and research. So without much ado, I will hand over the mic to my co-chairperson, Dr. Sandeep Kadam from Pune, and uh, he will uh, formally introduce Dr. Gabriel Varian and also make his comments. Over to Thank you, you sir. Th thank you very much, sir. Uh, it's an honor to uh, introduce Professor Gabriel Varian. He's a medical director at the Neu Neurological NISU at Sao Paulo, Brazil. He's a staff consultant. Most important, he's a founder of Protecting Brain and Saving Future. As Rightly said by uh, Dr. Ranjan Pejawar, sir, we, are, we have a lot of problems of HI. We have technology, but more important, using that technology in our perspective, especially for the 
lower middle income countries and most important using the technology not only helps save our babies but it's very important to have intact survival and i'm sure with uh, dr gabriel who has done his graduation from brazil at sao paulo he's also started an organization he's using technology his uh, area of research has been neuroprotection in lower middle income countries he's been collaborating with the imperial college at london and we also has done a lot of uh, collaborative research uh, with from the stanford university in united states so i'm sure with his vast experience in learning and teaching and he has been involved in focus in spreading a knowledge in various countries through various webinars and seminars i am sure at the end of this lecture we are going to have enriched minds and we can use this in our day to day practice to save babies and have more and more intact survival so without wasting much time over to you sir thank you very much and we would also request all the delegates to write their questions in the q a box so that at the end of this lecture we'll take those questions one by one so please write your questions in the question answer session so that we can cover these questions at the end of the lecture and uh, i am sure with uh, many participants it is going to be a interactive session so we look forward to having more and more questions from all of you over to you sir uh, in first place i would like to say thank you so much for the organizing committee and to dr ranjan and dr sandeep for the kind introduction and again i feel definitely honored to be part of this uh, fantastic uh, webinar conference and a series and again very very honored to be talking about a topic that i particularly think it's really really important that how can we add technology uh, to help us to take uh, care of these babies at high risk for brain injury in our scenario so i will start sharing my screen please let me know if you can see this right now And I will just uh, move to full just a sec. Can you see my screen? Yeah, it's fine. OK. Now just a sec. There you go. And wow. So the topic I'm going to talk today is using technology to protecting brains in resource limited countries. And just before uh, starting our, uh, our talk, actually, I would like to have a very, very quick poll with you on to only two questions that I would like to set a baseline and actually understand how our scenario from the delegates from this webinar is uh, different or similar from the one I live here in Brazil. So I'll gently ask to, to you to fill and uh, answer the poll only two questions there you go so the first question uh would be asking so how does your center uh provide therapeutic hypothermia for neonates with perinatal asphyxia and moderate or severe hie and i would like you to answer if yes you are providing therapeutic hypothermia and you use a servo controlled thermal mantras or yes, you're using providing therapeutic hypothermia, but you're doing passive cooling with ice gel packs or turning the heated grip off, off or no, you're not providing therapeutic hypothermia, but you can transfer your baby with AGIE to a center that provides cooling or no, uh, you're not able to provide cooling in your center and neither being able to transfer these infants and please feel free to answer. So there you go. So the majority, uh, actually 49% of the respondents are providing therapeutic hypothermia and they're using uh, servo controlled thermal mantras. Also, you're gonna see this is a bit different from what we have here in Brazil. And around 19% here are you providing therapeutic hypothermia but using passive cooling or, or just turning the heated grid off. Okay, so we can move to the next question, which would, be gonna be about brain monitoring uh, methodologies. So what are doing in your centers? Uh, so uh, the next question would be, does your service have the possibility of providing uh, continuous brain monitoring with EG or AEG, amplitude integrated EG, and only three options. So no, you, uh, you do not count with the possibility of performing EG or AEG in your center, even intermittently 
or no, you, you can perform conventional EEG, but not continuously during the entire cooling period. Or yes, uh, you have the possibility of providing continuous brain monitoring for AEG or EEG in your center. So please feel free to answer the poll and soon we can see the results. So around one third for each part, right? But only 38% actually can provide continuous brain monitoring during uh, the cooling period during this first 72 hours of life. Okay, so this is kind of, uh, a nice baseline. I'm gonna share you the data from what we have here in Brazil. And moreover, I truly think we can discuss again, how can we use technology to protect the brains of our little babies at high risk for brain injury. So let's start. Uh, so just as disclosure, I'm the founder and currently work as director of Protecting Brains and Saving Futures organization, which I'm gonna sh show to you during this presentation. So uh, the objectives of this talk includes uh, describing unique healthcare challenges for infants at high risk for brain injury in the developing world. We're going to list the challenge to implementation of these neuroprotective strategies in low mid income countries. And we're going to describe the benefits and results of a telemedicine model for assistance of infants at high risk. So just starting with an ontology overview, we know, oh, there you go. Just a sec. Just a sec. So just starting with an anatology overview, we have important, we know we face important reduction in mortality rates, which is really good, but we have a high number of infants who survive with risk of neurological impairments. So looking at the world scenario and talking in this presentation specifically about infants with HIE, we know that epidemiological studies bring us to us that we have in the world over 1 million infants with HIE per year. And from those over 230,000 infants with HIE will develop important neurological impairment every single year. And I always like to think if this is actually a representative number because you know we're talking worldwide, but if you think this is one of the largest soccer stadiums in the world and have around one, 100,000 people here, if you multiply this number by 2.3, and remember, we have this number of infants that will develop important neurological impairment every single year, this is actually a very, very important number. So uh, this is not only the social impact, what about the economic burden of this population? This is also truly, truly important. Mm -hmm. Here we have a study done by in the United States and being done by RTI and CDC. And they were estimating the direct and indirect costs of this population. And we are talking, and when we talk about infants and babies that will develop neurological impairments, the indirect costs are really, really important. And especially we're talking about productive loss here for 10, 20, 30 years of their lives. So the product loss is really, really important. And results from this study being done in the US, so they have uh, they estimated the lifetime cost with only American population from children with development disabilities, they are over $67 billion. So this is a very important cost. Uh, we have done a similar study here in Brazil, so you are estimating that infants with severe disability may have a 150 time increasing cost among 20 years of life. And we know the economic burden of this population is truly, truly important, again, worldwide. So in conclusion, we know that high risk situations for brain injury implying high mortality rates, high morbidity and high cost. And by uh, looking into this, we know that today we face an evolution in the focus of the need to care, that now we want to improve neurological and neurodevelopmental outcomes. So we want to reduce the mortality, but with good neurological and neurodevelopmental outcomes, and this makes lots of sense. And the first question would be, okay, but how does neonatal care vary across the developed and developing world? Because, you know, we may face completely different scenarios, and of course, we may face different levels of assistance. So I'm invite you all of you to 
look under the scenario under the lens of a new perspective. And in this presentation, we are going to talk about the healthcare situation in developing countries, a new approach, collaboration with international studies, and potential benefits. So starting with healthcare situation in developing countries. So here we have the world map, and we could look into this into country income groups. Uh, if you look in for high income groups, we know that usually we have good quality data, good quality prenatal care, investments in new technologies, strategies to the newborn care, lower rates of neonatal sepsis, mortality, and neurological impairment. Uh, but what about the low middle income countries? It's the same scenario, and we know it's not the same scenario. So usually we have lack of good quality data, a wide range of resources offer, incredible variability of protocols and neonatal assistance, poor prenatal care, higher rates of sepsis, mortality, and neurological impairment. Uh, talking specifically about HIE, the incidence in high-income countries of HIE ranges from one to two per 1,000 live births. And when we come to low middle income countries, the incidence is much, much higher. Actually, uh, if you're talking about birth asphyxia, it could range from 4.6 per 1,000 Cape Town to 26 per 1,000 Nigeria. Case fatality rates may be 40% or even higher. And actually, because the limited availability of this data, the figures are likely to underestimate the real proportion of mortality and morbidity due to birth asphyxia in these countries. Here, if you're looking uh, at uh, another study and looking at the regional burden of neonatal deaths and then cephalopathy outcomes for babies affected by intra events, actually you can see that the large number of the population worldwide come from the low middle income countries and we know this very well. So just by understanding this scenario, it would be really interesting to think on a new approach. So how can we deal with the situation? And in first, uh, in first glance, we could think, okay, so how high income uh, countries are dealing with the situation, trying to reduce the chances of these infants develop neurological impairment. And now we have these strategies that include brain focus and NICU care, and we're going to talk specifically about uh, neuroprotection. But talking about brain focus and NICU care, actually, there is an increased use in clinical practice of multiple methods for brain assessment in order to improve the neurological and neurodevelopmental outcomes. And here, a very strong concept that uh, is growing over the entire world is the neurological neonatal ICU concept. This is a picture from universities in the United States, and they teach us uh, some principles on pillars of this concept that includes continuous brain monitoring, neuroassessment, neuroimaging, and neuroprotection. And talking specifically about neuroprotection, and if you're talking about HIE, of course, brings uh, therapeutic hypothermia to the discussion. And we know that, especially in high-income countries, this is being applied as a standard of care for infants with moderate or severe uh, AGI on a large scale by different projects and programs over the world. In 2015, I got the privilege to visit the University of Cambridge in the UK and to know this project, which is the BIBOP or Babe Brain Protection, that in 2012 implemented on a large scale at the, that infants in the east of England that would uh, have birth asphyxia and moderate to severe AGI would receive proper cooling in the centers. And uh, of course, this brings us to the next question. So what about the implementation and efficacy of these strategies in low middle income countries? And there is some data, important data about this. And here is a meta-analysis from Dr. Sorin Peyo's group, where he was looking at the effect of cooling on neonatal mortality. And he found actually, this group actually found that cooling therapy was not associated with significant reduction in neonatal mortality in low middle income countries. And the big question here is why? What exactly happened? Uh, because uh, we know that actually uh, cooling should work for this population. So the apparent lack of treatment effect might be due to the heterogeneity and poor quality of these included studies in this meta-analysis, inefficiency of the low technology cooling devices, lack of optimal neonatal intensive care, sedation, ventilatory support, overuse of oxygen, or could even be due to the intrinsic difference in the with high rates of perinatal infection, obstructed labor, intrauterine growth retardation, and maternal malnutrition. So there are some important points that might explain exactly uh, 
the apparent lack of the treatment. Uh, by understanding this scenario worldwide, I would like you to invite to understand the scenario I live here, the country I live in Brazil, and explain what exactly we face in our reality here. So just to talk briefly about Brazil, you know, in Brazil, we are a country that we like soccer a lot. Actually, we love soccer and we have the largest carnival in the world. And we are actually have many, many beautiful places to visit. And definitely I invite you to come to Brazil when it's feasible too. But it's really, really a, a nice country to come. And but uh, we're actually much, much more than this. So Brazil, we have a population of over 200 million people. We have 26 different states. And we talk specifically in anatology. In Brazil, we have around 3 million live births a year. From those, uh, we have estimated around 20,000 uh, infants with HIV per year. This brings us the number two babies with HIV per hour uh, in our situation. And even looking uh, further into the overview of our scenario here in Brazil. So we have over 8,000 neonatal care beds. We have lack of resources on a variety scale. And I, we have a huge, and I mean, we have a huge variability in clinical practice across the country. So uh, talking about heterogeneity of care, we have level three neonatal intensive care units, you know, that may, might have everything you want. So centers with large amount of resources, equipment, specialized multidisciplinary team, fetal surgery, advanced imaging, again, everything you want. But we have, on the other hand, centers level three units with centers with lack of resources, equipment, lack of this multidisciplinary approach, or any can kind of advanced imaging, and actually don't have a robust neonatal transport network. So it actually depends where you are born. Uh, and what about the cooling practice in Brazil by understanding the scenario we live? So we published in 2018 uh, a survey that we're looking uh, what a survey related to the assessment. So how people were dealing with babies with HIE and therapeutic hypothermia practices across the country. And this survey included over 1,000 participants from most of states in Brazil. So what are, were the results? And that I told you, they are a bit differently from the pool we just got. So for all uh, respondents, actually we found that 62% of professionals reported using therapeutic hypothermia, uh, which in the first glance is quite good. Uh, but reasons for not providing would include lack of adequate equipment, uh, knowledge, training with this intervention from these professionals that do not provide cooling. 94% stated either not having a referral center to provide cooling or unable to perform the transfer within the first six hours of life. So again, it actually depends where the baby is born, if he will receive or, no this, or not this treatment. But talking specifically about the, the professionals that responded that they were providing cooling to the population, we found that only 26% were using a servo controlled system, so the vast majority would do passive cooling or use of ice gel packs uh, for assessment of encephalopathy. And this is something that I think might be some troublesome. So from the centers that were doing cooling, only 58% reported using Sarnat neurological score, 8% report, uh, reported using a different neurological score, and 22% reported not using any neurological score. So exactly, we're not sure how they are indicating these babies for cooling or not. And what is really, really troublesome is that from the ones that were using neurological score, only 20% had received any type of training for that. So again, how we are choosing and selecting our babies for the therapy is something that really, really uh, works us. And talking specifically now about brain monitoring and imaging. So you understand the number of centers that were doing cooling, who are using the proper equipment, who is doing the neurological assessment adequately. And what about brain monitoring and imaging? So we found that only 12% of respondents who provide therapeutic hypothermia had a G or AG readily available, and only 4% had access to neurophysiology services and continuous video EG. And talking about imaging, only 19% would be able to perform the MRI, and 
43% actually could pro, uh, provide an MRI in an outside location, but it was really not clear whether this was being done or not routinely for these babies. And a good sign here, 72% uh, of centers had access to neurology, uh, neurology consultation, which is quite good. Uh, quite good for the, this population. And the last part of the survey, we will ask it for follow-up. So how these babies after discharge are being conducted. So follow-up was unavailable at almost half of centers. And when available was established multi-semana follow-up program was presented on only 21% of the centers. So again, as conclusion, we found that results from this large survey demonstrate that therapeutic hypothermia has been implemented in Brazil, but with significant heterogeneity in most aspects of its management. And actually, for final results, we have a huge variability in the criteria for therapeutic hypothermia indication, management, method of cooling and monitoring, and even inappropriate follow up. So, actually, by understanding this scenario a couple of years ago, I remember that by that time, I thought that I got a brilliant idea by that time, you know, I came directly to the government and just asked them, well, you know, we just have these very nice examples from high income countries. And, you know, why should we not start a large project to implement adequate care for infants at high risk in our country? You know, people are doing this. We should do this. And I was really, really excited by that time. And when I came to the government, they just said, oh, Gabriel, we are not a high-income country, don't have money, forget about it. We are not, you know, we are not okay. Uh, we don't have money for this. And you know, no money, no honey, so sorry. There is no way we could implement this in Brazil right now. And of course, by that time, I was quite frustrated. But then we started to think about possibilities. And okay, so we have world, uh, across the world different programs that implemented this on a large scale. Uh, we live in Brazil, which is a continental country, a very large one here in South America. We don't have much money, that, that's true. Uh, but maybe, maybe, maybe technology might help us uh, to overcome these barriers. So this is where we started, where we started thinking about a new project around four years ago, which is the PBSF project or Protecting Brains and Saving Futures project, which is a low cost, self-sustainable project that united a group of specialists that you want to teach, enable, implement protocols of neuroprotection, early diagnosis in infants at high risk for brain injury on a large scale in our country. So we are a private organization who wants to make a united effort with hospitals, physicians, industry, healthcare insurance, Ministry of Health, everyone, put everyone together for the same goal. So as I told you, we started PBSF project around four years ago. And actually for this project, we have two main pillars. The first one would be teaching and implementation of methodologies and protocols. And the second one would be our intelligence project. And we are gonna run through this presentation for both pillars. So starting with the first one. So which were the initial aims for PDSF projects. So we wanted to promote longitudinal training and use of standard international validated protocols. And I may say that training and education is a really, really important part of this project. Uh, implementation of structured therapeutic hypothermia across a large number of centers. Implementation of brain monitoring, and this may include uh, video EEG, AEG, NIRS for infants at high risk, again, on a large scale. And the big thing here, and I'm going to repeat this word many times during this presentation, we want to promote homogeneity of care across the country. This is really, really important in this project also, homogeneity of care. So the big question or the next question here, okay, how could we do this in a country, you know, where we don't have many resources? And we truly think, and we've thought about this four years ago, that by using information of technology, a telemedicine system and developing what we call the CSI, or Central of Surveillance Intelligence, it's a monitoring center, we could achieve this. So the CSI is actually a monitoring center that can connect to any NICU across the entire country and now even internationally. And of course, when we do this, uh, we can have a, a database that can connect physicians, research centers, universities, industry itself. But this approach has, uh, has several advantages that must not be ignored. So 
Uh, the first one would be centralizing data from different and distant populations. You have a high specialized live assistance, 24 hours by seven, high level of teaching, longitudinal training. It's different from doing, you know, I'm gonna do a course and implement a protocol. No, I do a course, implement a protocol, and I follow each patient that is included in that protocol. So this is really interesting. Uh, intensive support to the clinical staff, again, 24 hours by seven, you have a specialized team, aiding the NICU and the physician at the bedside. This facilitates the implementation of methodologies and protocols in different centers in a lower cost, cost model, which is really important. And this allows, again, homogeneity of care between centers with different amount of resources, which is really, really nice. Uh, so this is just a video that I'm trying to explain to you how this works. Uh, so we have here a baby being monitored in a remote center. <laughs> All the information goes directly to a cloud system, uh, to a cloud system to uh, Microsoft Azure. And we have a monitoring center and a remote team that 24 by 7 is responsible for reviewing this exam, providing feedback, discussing the clinical case, and again, promoting homogeneity of care. So just to make it more visual to you, so here we have a baby being monitored in a city called Belém in the Parai state of Brazil. This is in the north of Brazil. So he's receiving cooling, he's receiving brain monitoring. Here the information travels over 2000 kilometers and comes directly to our monitoring center here in Sao Paulo, Brazil. So, and everything of course stays, uh, this information stays on a cloud servers, uh, centralized in a very uh, security, uh, if it's very, secure way. So talking about IT and security itself, so we have a physical environment, which you have the cloud systems, the monitoring center, all information comes to a high availability data center, we have local data protection, a central security management console, all data is uploaded and encrypted, and all remote access, of course, is always authenticated, and we have a central remote access management. Again, it's very important, so we have a very robust security system to deal with this data from these babies to traveling through the internet. So, talking about this and this introduction about PDSF projects, it's time to share with you some of our experience. So again, we started this project four years ago, and when we started this, we started with three different centers in the city of Sao Paulo. And right now we have experienced this with over 30 different hotels across the entire country, we have centers in all regions of Brazil right now. And again, uh, from this baby being monitoring, we have remote access by the CSI 24 by seven, and all information is stored in a central and secure database. Uh, moving forward again, so I, we do implement brain monitoring and another piece of information, another piece of this project that's really, really important again is promoting homogeneity of care. So we use standard protocols and a very robust education program. And from the protocols that we implement too is are really, really important. And the first one would include the cooling indication and we follow the NICHD criteria and management from these babies. And we have brain monitoring indications and I'm gonna share to you what we're doing right now. So we have this protocol that's adapted from Lucille Parker Children's Hospital from NeuroNICU at Stanford. So there are 14 indications that we're doing brain monitoring for these babies. So babies that uh, have HIE and are receiving cooling, babies with seizures, the preterm population, especially if they have complications such as IVH or shock, congenital heart disease, severe IVH or hydrocephalus, inhibit errors of metabolism and metabolic disease, CNS malformations, central nervous system infection, severe sepsis, hemodynamic instability, ventilatory instability, hemodynamic significant PDA, depending on the case, babies with mild HIE that are not receiving cooling, and beer, uh, babies with severe hyperbilirubinemia, and babies uh, in under ECMO. So this is our protocol that we implement across the centers that we are working. And again, a very important part of this project is education. So we built a course that we call NeuroNICO from theory to clinical practice. In the last three years, we have provided 17 different NICU courses, which are actually uh, hands-on workshops and we've trained over 850 people 
uh, last year uh, we did a very very large and we're really really uh, proud to made one of the largest or maybe the largest uh, conference to talk specifically about AGI being done in Latin America that we counted with over uh, 1,000 people and with nine different international speakers. This was a very, very nice experience. And talking about neonatal and online neonatal conferences, uh, we're really proud that uh, this year in Brazil, we've done uh, a conference for over 15,000 attendings and again, using technology to spread education, which is exactly what we're doing right now, which is really, really nice which is a lesson that uh, this specifically year of 2020 teaches us. But again, moving back to our talk and presentation, remember this project uh, stays because we want to do standardization of care and clinical practice guidelines between different centers through the use of telemedicine. And again, I told you I'm gonna repeat this a lot in this presentation, you want to do promote homogeneity of care. And take a look. It's really, really nice that when we use this model, we can implement the same protocols of brain filter systems from the largest private NICU group here in Brazil with over 200 NICU beds, with over 30,000 life births per year to very small public NICU in distant places. And we have here uh, a region in Brazil called Baixada Santista region that had the highest infant mortality and birth asphyxia rates over Sao Paulo state. And there were some small cities in this region that would have up to 24 child deaths for 1,000 life births in some cities. And up to 2016, no center would provide cooling or brain monitoring or anything related to this. And up to 2018, three different centers were associated to PBSF program and implemented the similar protocols and brain focus assistance from the wealthiest NICU centers of the country. And what was really, really nice that we faced a very important uh, reduction in infant mortality rates in the past three years in this region. And of course, this, this is teamwork, but we like to think that this project actually also uh, help it to make the difference in the region. And just to show you some of our data, here we have data from July 2017 to June 2020. So this is a three year period from the centers and babies we monitored. So from that period, uh, we monitored over 3000 babies with over 200,000 hours of monitoring. And by that time we experienced this in 28 uh, different hospitals, and we found our right uh, on had our almost 35,000 connections between CSI team and the local staff. And when we started, we were monitoring 15 babies uh, per month, and in June, we were monitoring around 130 babies by that month. So just looking at overall data from this population and from all babies we monitored, we found seizures in 24% of them by providing the brain monitoring. And the most relevant monitoring indications included suspected seizures, HIE, but not cold babies, HIE that received cooling, previously treated seizures, hemodynamic and ventilatory instability, babies with complex congenital heart disease, and sepsis. And from that population, so seizures by monitoring indications, this is a question that people's people bring me all the time. There are four most relevant groups that I would like to share to you. So babies with AJA that received cooling, 37% of them received uh, had seizures in this cohort. From infants, preterm population with severe IVH or shock, 23% of them got seizures. Babies that were diagnosed previously with seizures uh, and then started doing the brain monitoring, 35% of them had new seizures under the EEG monitoring, and babies with congenital heart disease, 25% of them presented uh, seizures, especially in the post-operative period. And for seizures classification, from the babies with diagnosed seizures by providing brain monitoring, 74% of them only uh, were diagnosed with subclinical seizures and 14% of them had clinical or subclinical seizures. And this is data from literature. Actually, this we know that most of seizures are actually subclinical and they're really difficult to monitor if you're not doing, you're not providing brain monitor. And looking at the number of anticonvulsants per infant, of course, the ones that presented seizures, 
uh, only one drug, which is, of course, the phenobarbital, was able to stop seizures and control seizures in only 57% of these infants. So around 43% of, uh, of, of babies with seizures needed at least two anticonvulsants to control, uh, this, to control the, the seizures they were having. Uh, and this brings us to the possibility and the ability to doing some sub-analysis. And again, looking now for only infants with HIE, uh, we had in this cohort treated with therapeutic hypothermia over 500 infants, 37% of them presented seizures as we just showed to you. And most of them, as also we know from the literature comes in the first day of life. And some of them around 80% came into the rewarming period in this population. Uh, so, okay, so uh, we're talking about the PBSF project and we're talking about the first pillar, which would be teaching and implementation of protocols. And now we're moving to the second pillar, which is our intelligence project. And I always like to look at the rationale for this. And when, you know, we're talking about telecommunication, you can use a simple device just as this and connect anywhere in the world lively, just again, as we're doing right now. And when we come to the NICU, we have all these fancy monitors that provide information continuously to us. But in the end of the day, you know, uh, we are just looking into a piece of information that every two hours, for, uh, for instance, uh, someone will just add back there a piece of the information, even if you're doing uh, electronic uh, using electronic records, most of the time you're just recording a piece of information from this population. So what do we think about the proposal and evolution of this model? And we truly think that through, you know, intelligent monitoring center, we might provide uh, remote assistant, correlate information in the NICU and allow better understanding of the physiology. And this actually may aid to create new treatment algorithms in the future. So we truly believe in the importance of correlating different findings into the NICU and we might use technology to do this. So just to explain what was our learning experience. So when we started four years ago, when we started the PBSI project, while we, we were doing uh, in our monitoring center, all we could do it would be the remote EEG, and most of times would be two or three channel EEG plus amplitude integrated EEG. And right now, what we can do, we are adding more pieces of this information. And one that is really nice is now that in the same platform, we can add the NEARS information, near infrared spectroscopy, which is cerebral oximetry and somatic. Uh, oximetry. So here, when we are doing now, we're doing brain monitoring remotely, you can look at the brain function by the EEG and also brain oxygenation, which is really nice. And combining this information might be really, really useful. I'm just going to show to you one simple case. Uh, so this is a term baby intubated due to meconium aspiration, pulmonary hypertension, ventilatory instability, and, and sepsis. And in the third day of life, he got this AEG. We remember that uh, doing EG in the NICU is much more than just for seizure screening. It's actually, you can look at brain function and you can clearly see that some things really wrong happened here to this baby in this time period. The background activity was really, really depressive in acute form. And when we add another piece of information, I can clearly see that here in the blue line, the cerebral oxygenation goes down. And when the cerebral oxygenation goes down, we can see a clearly depression on the EEG and it gets better. And when the cerebral oxygenation gets better, the EEG recovers as well. And it's really nice to understand the correlation between these those parameters and what happened to this baby. He got, you know, obstruction in the tube and that, that was, why this happened. But you know, ideally we would not only correlate the brain monitoring findings, but actually all kinds of findings and vital signs from this baby. So uh, not only putting EEG and NEARS together, but why not putting SpO2, heart rate, temperature, blood pressure, everything together in the same platform. So now we are working a system similar like this, that here we can see the temperature, the pulse oximetry, the cerebral oximetry, heart rate, the EEG, and so on. Uh, and here's just a case discussion. So how putting this together might 
allow us to understand or better understand the physiology. So here we have a preterm baby with 30 weeker, third day of life, he was diagnosed with meningitis. And here is the trend line monitor for him from all vital signs and brain monitoring. So here we have temperature, the near findings, the pulse oximetry findings, and heart rate. And this is a 38 hour window. So the trace is very compressed. Take a look at the correlation. So here, when I have a decrease in pulse oximetry, I have an increase in heart rate and a decrease also in years. And if you look at this, this repeats every many, many times during the trace. And this makes sense, you know, you have a decrease in pulse oximetry, you have repercussion of this uh, on years and also on heart rate. This makes sense. Uh, but take a look in the end, in the last curve here. So here we have a sustained decrease on cerebral saturation. We have moments of important hypoxia, but it recovers sometimes. And we have moments that the heart rate goes down, then it goes up, then it goes into the middle of the way. So something different is happening in this part. And when we add another piece of information when we add the EEG, we can clearly see, uh, and this was confirmed by raw EEG, this baby uh, went on the status. And when he went on the status, probably the consumption of oxygen in the brain was higher. And that was why the cerebral sets went lower. And you know, and you could see all these the saturations and the heart rate going upside and down. But again, I think the beauty of this kind of system is that we can better understanding what's happening to the physiology of this baby. So this is our new operational concept. So now we have have here the baby being monitored in the hospital. We collect data from all, from the vital signs monitoring, from the EEG, from NIRS, we integrate the data, we send the data to a cloud system, and then our team at the monitoring center can better understand the physiology and give it back to the team. So what's up next? Uh, and you know that uh, what would be really interesting for our system and from our scenario, we would like to create uh, accurate alarm systems. And there are many groups and many nice publications on this already. But what you are working is with a system that's sending mail to the neural monitoring team, you know, for automated seizure detection or AEG pattern changes. And again, when you're doing brain monitoring, it's not only for seizure detection, it's also looking at brain function. And take a look at this case. We have a term infant, upper scores of two, four, five, seven. The blood gas uh, has important uh, acidosis. This baby uh, underwent cooling. He got seizures within the first day of life. But with 24 hours of life, this baby got this background activity would uh, call for continuous normal voltage, which is really, really good for this infant. And actually the prognosis right here was quite good. Uh, but then, we received an alert. This was 4.50 a.m. And the new AG pattern was found like Heiser, Heiser from Heiserletric. And this is the exactly time point at 4.50 a.m. in the morning. So this raised a red alert. So we called the center and said, oh, something's happened to this baby. And they recalled the physician and told, no, is the baby having a seizure? And I told, no, actually worse than this, the background is, activity is very, very depressed. Please, you know, go see this baby. And he said, oh, you know, the heart rate is quite normal. Blood pressure is normal. Pulse oximetry is definitely normal. And you know, he's not moving, but you know, he, this baby has HIE, maybe it's because of that. And I recall, no, there is something really acute happening to this baby. And uh, the physician at the bedside went to do an echo and he found a cardiac tamponade. And we know that cardiac tamponade, if you underdiagnose it, might lead this baby to a cardiac arrest and new brain injury or even death. And for this baby, actually here, uh, the physician was doing the Marfan puncture and this baby actually never got a cardiac arrest. Here's the moment that we have the depression on the brain activity and less than one hour, it was already recovering, which is really good. And the outcome for this baby was quite good. So he was discharged 10 days of life, normal MRI when he reached home uh, with seven months, nine months of age here with one year of the age, the baby was already walking and also, you know, shopping, which is really good for the economy of the country as well. And again, this is, I think this is a good, uh, a good case, a good example of how reaching a 
uh, earlier alarming might make a, a huge difference on the evolution of a baby. And this brings the discussion to a new level because you know what's the evolution for this. Of course, we would like to analyze this correlation between all monetary parameters. We can work with big data analysis from this national database, machine learning system, creation of new risk scores, promoting earlier and more accurate diagnosis of brain injury. All these, there are many possibilities for us to doing this. And I would just like to show uh, the system we are developing right now. So this is the, uh, the view from the physician and the monitoring center. Here's a space view of all centers that we're monitoring in Brazil. The center is called Santa Casa University. And when we are doing the brain monitoring for this baby, actually now we can look not only on brain monitoring findings, but we can look at the AG, at blood pressure, pulse oximetry, the nearest findings, heart rate. So we put our information together and we can classify this for the video a little bit. Uh, and we can classify all these babies that are being monitoring automatically accord, uh, according to their risk, you know, uh, looking at heart rate, pulse oximetry, again, all vital signs and brain monitoring findings. And in the end of the day, all this information comes directly to the dynamic dashboard so we can understand what's happening to all the population. And we're really proud and really proud to uh, collaborate nowadays uh, with Microsoft themselves because we are working on a new cloud architecture and AI project to improve our uh, assistance capabilities. So in the end of the day, uh, the CSI or our Center of Surveillance Intelligence is much more than just a monitoring center. It's actually a project of medicine, engineering, information of technology uh, that has a specialized team that runs a server web in order to get real time information from the associated centers that provides uh, remote assistance, filtering, storage, classification and protection of this information working with capability of correlation to this stored information creation of what we call neural networks and in order to promote knowledge generation clinical research. So in the end of the day, uh, the CSI is a project of diagnostic assistance, information and knowledge generation. So Gabriel, uh, so I understand the work you're doing, but you know, when PDSF works in a hospital, what exactly do you do? So we work as an advanced telemedicine model in order to aid and structure the neuronic concept across different centers. How? By implementing the technology protocols and all required methodologies, promoting initial and longitudinal training. Again, education is so important in this project, associated with monthly video conference with all associated centers, implementation of the CSI connect 24 by 7, allowing the use of standard protocols, case discussion, remote brain monitoring, promoting data storage and analysis of NICU results, and working as a highly specialized assistance model with homogeneity of protocols, clinical care, ensuring the optimization of methodologies and resources. And which is really nice, it's much easier and faster applicability if you compare in doing this one by one center across the entire country. Uh, just very briefly, and we're ending our presentation for future directions. Uh, we want to have now a closer neurophysiology approach and implementation of remote video in a larger number of centers uh, with amplified telemedicine assistance, uh, considering uh, giving uh, consultations for neurology, genetics, cardiology, infections, disease team, neuroradiology development care and follow up and assessments really important and really a barrier for this project. So what do you want to do for follow following this population? So through, uh, throughout the use of technology, again, we are planning to have longitudinal connections to every single infant family who was assisted by PDSF with our own follow up assessment PDS team, collaboration with uh, local follow up clinics and all data again uh from follow-up will be stored in single database that's the idea so as future directions right now we have experience in over 30 hospitals in brazil but our goal in the next few years is just to reach at least 100 hospitals across the country and of course this brings us to another level of discussion and our goal is also to promote an international brain monitoring network and this is feasible of course there are barriers but this is definitely feasible so uh, and in this new approach, the way you are use, we are using technology here in Brazil to aid this population at high risk for brain injury, I would like also to share a few collaboration with international studies. 
And this is a study that we are really proud to be part of. This is the PREVENT study or prevention of epilepsy by reducing neonate encephalopathy. The chief investigator is Dr. Surin Teo, the trial sponsor is Imperial College London, and the, the study is funded by NIH. So the rationale of this study that is being conducted in India right now is that 50 to 70 million people, there are 50 to 70 million people with epilepsy worldwide. We have estimated 12 million people with epilepsy in India. The incidence of epilepsy in low middle income countries is two or three times higher than high income countries. The perinatal brain suits accounted for the largest attributive fraction of pediatric and adult epilepsy in these countries. And programs to improve perinatal care in low middle income countries may prevent a substantial proportion of epilepsy. So what does this study propose? Uh, we have four intrapartum interventions that consist in constant birth companion, fetal surveillance during active labor, labor management by e-partogram, uh, brain-oriented early newborn care with resuscitation, and the assessment of newborn outcomes includes EEG and MRI. And for PBS collaboration, what we're doing in this project, we created an advanced telemedicine model and an EG cloud-based system to the prevent study. And the number of estimated monitoring infants in this study is gonna be 2,000. So what exactly happened? So uh, Dr. Surin Teod asked me from Brazil to implement this system directly in India. So we are running this study in three important centers in Bangalore, Calicut, and Hubli and providing EEG monitoring in the centers. And all this information can be assessed by the remote research team, which includes Dr. Sodin Teo, Dr. Ronit Presler, and, and that are located uh, in London, UK. And all this information, you know, from the local hospitals comes to the cloud and this can be accessed by the remote research team. So this is what we're doing in this study. We're providing this architecture and just to show to you how does this work, this infrastructure and security is like this uh, brief video. So we have information coming from the three hospitals. We have an XM database replication, the PBSF central database, and we can have feedback and reports from the remote research team. And very briefly, the data security precautions. Uh, all local devices have security systems that provide malware protection, management, updates. Everything's controlled by a central cloud. All locations have equipment data backup uh, capabilities with advanced technology notification, encryption, compression, optimizing, again, all the data transmission bandwidth and uh, ensuring this additional layer of security. And communication between the local equipment and the central servants is always uh, done in, with encrypted data, protecting the privacy of transmitted data. And this is a picture of part of this team. This is a very large study from the Prevent team. Again, I'm very honored to be part of this group. So to end our presentation, I would just like to remember some potential benefits of preventing or uh, uh, children to develop neurological impairment. And of course, the first one is the economic benefit. We know that by reducing the number of patients with neurological impairment, there will also be a significantly reducing the direct and direct costs of this population. This is very important when we want to convince people to invest in this kind of methodologies. Uh, for the hospital itself, it adds technology, intelligence, and a remote team to aid in the treatment of neonates at high risk. And of course, the largest benefit ever is what we think is that we have sometimes the opportunity of changing life histories, allowing more infants to fulfill their uh, physical and cognitive potential. And this is really, really important. And so in conclusion, strategies to reduce the chance of brain injury and time reduction of mortality, morbidity, and cost. And this is truly, truly important. Uh, and just for acknowledgement, I would like to say thank you to all my team. This is actually part of our team is, is growing quite fast, uh, that work on daily basis, providing and allowing this project to grow. And there is a line, there is a, a phrase that I always like to think and bring into my talks, that we think that pre uh, preventing neurological impairment is actually a large, a very, very big challenge. And not just a challenge for Brazil, but actually worldwide. So this is a line from Anton Lake, former executive director from UNICEF, where he says, somewhere a child has been told he cannot play because he cannot walk, or another, she cannot learn because she cannot see. Well, that boy deserves a chance to play. And are we, that's the most true, are we benefit 
when that grow and our children can read, learn, and contribute. Well, the path forward will be challenged. It's not easy to prevent neurological impairment, but children do not accept unnecessary limits, neither should we. And then we uh, end our presentation. And just as one last announcement, I would like to uh, say that we are conducting together with Dr. Rani Bashir, Dr. Guilherme Santana, who presented early in this conference series, and also Dr. Topham Austin from Cambridge. Uh, we are running uh, a survey called Practice Related to the Management of Infants with HIE. Uh, and Dr. Rani Bashir will soon send you uh, a message similar to this, which is a really brief and fast survey that similar from what we published it here from the data of Brazil, we would like to understand what are the practices being conducted in India. And uh, again, thank you so much. It's really honored to be here with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gabriel Varian. That was a fascinating lecture. And we are, I mean, it's awesome that you are doing such good work. And as I mentioned earlier, you have gone beyond research. You have helped in implementation of the knowledge and benefits of the research and translated it into various hospitals, getting the benefit of that. Uh, I don't know whether I have missed uh, while you are speaking, what is the health system of Brazil? Is it is it uh, like in England, fully state-owned healthcare, or is it private and public healthcare? What what is the the healthcare system? So it's public and uh, and private as well. It's I may say around fifty percent of population goes to the public centers, and fifty percent would stay with the private care. Okay. So it's good. yeah. Because the reason I asked that was uh, Dr. Dennis Kalili had asked, how is the funding for this uh, beautiful project? That was his question. Yeah, so that's a very, very important question. And actually, uh, I think I'm going to share, I have uh, a question that, you know, people ask us all the time. So, you know, how this was economically feasible? What is the funding? And uh, actually what we're doing to the hospital, we are providing uh, a service. So we charge the hostels or the public centers or the public centers, we try to charge them for the brain monitoring hours, for instance. So we provide this service and in the end of the day, there is a report and we try, you know, to discuss with the hostel this importance and then we charge it. So uh, we had initial people who invested in this idea, but in the end of the day, the, pro uh, the project is self-sustainable because we are able to charge for this kind of assistance. And what percentage of your hospitals are purely private? And what percentage of your hospitals, which are under your program, are uh, you know, uh, purely government or public? Yeah, that's a very good question and thank you so much. So uh, actually, again, half. So 50% of all this, these infants that we monitored, over 3,000, around 50% come directly from the public centers and 50% from the private. So what you will understand is, again, that this is a kind of uh, assistance, this is a kind of model that could be uh, implemented in both public and private centers. And again, the I think the... The huge issue here and the, the, the most important step on implementing and actually convincing people to, you know, to adopting this kind of assistance in their center. And doesn't matter if it's private or public, it's actually showing them that, you know, by investing in preventing neurological impairment in children, they are not losing money. Actually, they are, you know, winning lots of money because, again, this is economically physical because the economic burden of this population is terrible, it's terrible. So the cost effectiveness of this kind of approach is important. Yeah. So there's there's a lot of health education you have done and you are continuing to do about uh, these things. Okay, I'll okay. now hand over the uh, mic to my co-chairperson, Dr. Sandeep Kadam. Can you take over and uh, proceed, uh, Dr. Sandeep? Yeah, Dr. Gabriel, it was an excellent presentation and you have shown how we could use uh, uh, technology to the benefit of our babies, especially in neonatal neurology. 
because we want to serve, save the babies, but we want them to have intact survival. And uh, there are a few questions which have come up. Uh, does EEG done in first six hours in a child who is in stage two HI exhibit changes to warrant giving therapeutic hypothermia? Yeah. So yes. So what do we do for all centers that we work? So uh, we implemented this equipment at the hospital. So the equipment is always in the hospital. So we train all the, the staff, the nursing and medical staff to start using the EG monitoring prior to six hours of life if the babies, you know, they have AJ. So this is actually really important because this brings us more information, you know, looking at the background activity or maybe at seizures themselves, if the baby needs to be received cooling, yes or not. So this is very useful and a very important part of the protocol to start uh, the brain monitoring prior six hours of life. Did your organization also provide equipments like cooling machine or amplitude integrated EG to peripheral centers? Yes, so uh, I think I'll, just a sec, I think I'll share a slide. Uh, so what actually happens? Yeah, so yes, again, this comes to the, the question how this is economically feasible. And what is really interesting, what we do, we implement uh, the equipment here in Brazil. We, uh, we implement all the equipment, the EG monitoring, and if the hospital wants also the, the cooling uh, equipment. And we charge nothing for the hospital by this because actually what we try to do is a, for instance, a five-year contract and we dilute the cost of this equipment over a five-year period. Why we do this? Because we want the project to be economically feasible for the hospital itself. So if you come to a hospital, but then you know, you know, this equipment are quite expensive. If they need to buy this, they don't want to start the projects. So what we try to do is to dilute this in many, many different years. So we do implement the, the equipment in the centers. The, the next question is, uh, your presentation was excellent and innovative and applying uh, IT to healthcare and integrating into NICU and therapeutic hypothermia. I'm sure this is a comment and I'm sure this can be implemented in our country uh, if government supports. Uh, there's one more comment that uh, it was a fantastic presentation, kindly asking how centers from lower middle income countries can key into this laudable initiative. I'm in a neonatology unit of uh, Lagos, in Nigeria. And most centers in Nigeria do not pool. Uh, the emphasis has been on neonatal resuscitation training to prevent HI rather than treat. So your comments on this. Yeah. So uh, in first place, thank you so much for the comment. And again, uh, I think we could connect in first place, you know, and further discuss maybe how could we show you and how could you know explain exactly what we have done here in Brazil and maybe find uh, even you know possibilities for collaboration because again uh, we are talking about brain monitoring we are talking about cooling but the main pillar of all these projects is promoting homogeneity of care and using telemedicine to you know to uh, have and to deliver specialized assistance to remote centers and we can and I may say we'll have already some international projects collaborating in could be both education and even helping this, their centers to structure something similar in their own country or even connected to PBSF itself. So we are definitely open uh, for discussion. And again, I would love to collaborate the way we can. Yeah, but it's definitely feasible and you can use this kind of system again, for providing resuscitation, but also for starting a cooling project and brain monitoring project in, in some centers as well. So I think this is quite the beauty of it. Yeah. Um, Ranjan sir, would you like to ask a few questions? So there's one more question. Uh, How was the neurodevelopmental follow-up done in those babies in Brazil, whether it was done at your center or in the peripheral units? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. And what happens, again, for this, this very, very moment, moment 
uh, is that we still rely, you know, so we work in, in 30 different centers. So we still rely in each center capability of provo uh, promoting this follow-up. And this will differ a lot from cent each center to another one. So we have few centers that have, you know, this a multidisciplinary approach and follow up very well structured but we have some centers that you know they cannot follow up this these children so what do we want to do to pdsf project and we know this is a very important pillar and if you want to show that this actually works it's important to follow up this population somehow so what we were working right now we're developing a new system you know it's like technology like an app that the families that Receive it, the PBSF assistance can be connected to us. And we are also uh, having some partnerships with other follow up clinics and again trying to promote this follow up in different ways. But this again is a big challenge because one thing is, you know, we are trying to do follow up in a single clinic and build a well structured pro program. The other thing is trying to build this in 30 different hospitals across the entire country. So this is a bit of a challenge. There's another question. If the age is normal, but the baby has all the criteria to suggest HIV stage two, are we not giving uh, these babies hypothermia? So that's a very good question as well. And I think this brings uh, an important discussion. But if you follow most of uh, international validated protocols and even the NICH criteria that we, we follow and use here in our centers, uh, actually, uh, if the baby has, you know, you do the neurological exam, and if the baby has moderate or severe uh, AGE, even if you do not see these abnormalities in the EG, even though you're going to provide cooling for this baby. So it's really, really important to be very well trained in the neurological exam for including babies in therapeutic yeah. hypothermia. During the study, was there any observation of Correlation of brain monitoring with amplitude integrated EEG and MRI changes for prognostic value. Yes, very, very good question as well. And yes, yes, actually we have even some, some publications in the literature, but are on. So what is really nice if when we have a baby with AJE and what we look are two things. Basically, we look what we call some call some studies might call time to normal trace, which would be how many hours uh, the baby needs, you know, to recover at least this continuous normal voltage, and uh, and it's really important. And we have some systematic reviews and many studies stating, you know, if the baby is receiving cooling. And if he recovers uh, to this normal trace between 48, up to 48 hours, he has a really, really high chance of having a good, uh, neurological outcome. And there are many studies also correlating this with the findings. So if the baby has you know, a sustained uh, pathological background activity for 72 hours and or over this, this is usually very well correlated with MRI abnormalities. So this is quite good. And also, which is really important when we are doing EG, seizure burden, but uh, there you need the conventional EG or the, the video EG itself. But the higher seizure burden for this population, we know this is related to MRI abnormalities and also neurological impairment. Um, I know that this is beyond the scope of uh, this project, but it would be useful to extend this telemonitoring concept to obstetric care and improve the monitoring of women in labor so that HIE can be prevented. Is there any idea which we can explore for tele-resuscitation to remotely assist clinicians during resuscitation? That's uh, an outstanding observation and that's very, very true. So I think when we're dealing with hypoxia ischemic encephalopathy, birth asphyxia, it's very important, you know, to, you know, that uh, there's, there is very important improvements that needs to be done in prenatal care, during labor, just after birth in the NICU and even in follow-up. So you, uh, finding ways to use telemedicine to improve every single one of these pillars is truly, truly important. And even 
in the project that we are doing and working together with Imperial College Loan, the PREVENT study, you know, being able to use e uh, electronic partograms, intelligent auscultation, but other projects that, you know, uh, could help use technology to assist labor would be really, really important. And also using telemedicine for education, for resuscitation itself, it's really important. So one major pillar, if you want to deal with HIE, is definitely the importance for preventing it. So yes, very, very good observation. Ranjan sir, are, uh, would you like to ask a few questions? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I want to make a comment that the last question or last this thing which was asked is a very sensible one. With the success of your project now, probably you should add some other things also which are related to neuroprotection, like the use of magnesium sulfate in preterm babies, and uh, you know even guide the hospitals regarding a little bit of prevention. I know it's asking for too much. You are still uh, uh, establishing and strengthening your foothold in one field, but you should keep that in mind. Now, there are people interested in knowing what is the criteria for choosing a center in your project? Yes. So, uh, in first place, again, I completely agree uh, with you, Dr. Ranjan. Again, uh, I think that's the, the path you want to move forward, you know. So, again, looking at prevention and look at preterm population. So, for the use of steroids, magnesium sulfate in this population, again, preventing neurological impairment even before the baby is born is it's really a major step and you want to move forward this direction. Uh, so I'm sorry, the question, the, sec the question you asked, it was about... That is, what's the criteria for choosing a center in your project? So actually the major criteria for choosing the, uh, the center, you want to, you know, uh, of course, I think ideally every single uh, Nietzsche would be able to provide at least, you know, uh, brain monitoring and implementation of protocols. But what we try to find here in Brazil is actually the referral centers uh, from each uh, city, each state, you know, that concentrates the, the largest amount of babies being born in that region. And what we try to work also, and we don't, do not have this very well established in Brazil, but we are working with projects, you know, to build a more robust transport system network. So uh, what we want to find is centers again uh, that might be referral centers and concentrate the expertise for this population and to provide both brain monitoring and all schooling. And we truly think this is the way you know you can concentrate better the, the investments that needs to be done. There's another question which says, during the study, was there any observation of correlation of brain monitoring with amplitude EEG and MRI changes for prognostication? Yes. With prognostic value? Yes. So. We, st we also do, do have a, a publication of a small study that published several years ago looking into this. Uh, but again, we have very, very nice data from the literature showing that the uh, prolonged, you know, sustained abnormalities in background activity, especially if, if baby is receiving cooling and he did not recover at least this continuous or continuous normal voltage with over 48 or 72 hours of life, the chances of this baby developing neurological impairment, and also this is very well correlated with MRI findings, is really, really huge. And the other one that all, when we look at the, the EEG, especially for EEG, if the baby has a higher seizure burden, then the chances of this baby having abnormalities in MRI is quite huge. There's another question which says, Brazil is an expensive country. How much cheaper is the monitoring and cooling system compared with Canada or Chile or Colombia? Mm, that's, that's quite a, a good question because exactly, uh, I'm not sure how much is, what is exactly the cost in those of countries. monitoring those countries. Uh, so I cannot uh, answer this 100%. Uh, what I can say, it's definitely, it's probably much, much less expensive than in the high income countries as well. But what, uh, what we try to do, uh, we don't set up like a, a price or something like this. What we always try to do is a 
a specific project for that center. And we always try to start the project somehow, you know, what's minimally necessary to make it feasible. And then with the uh, learning experience curve, then we start, you know, uh, implementing more monitors or things like this. But again, as one of the most important parts of this project relies on the education and implementing the protocols, even That's if right. we start with only one monitor and, you know, we make it really, really uh, not expensive, then we can al also already do a difference. Okay. I mean, have you had a lot of grants from your government or from international agencies have they been interested in this uh, gabriel i mean if i if i ha can take the liberty of asking that question yeah no you can definitely and we are uh, uh, i may say that in the early beginning we had none absolutely nothing actually we had some people that believe that this might be important and then helped us with with some investments but we did not have anything from grants from the government itself and now we are trying for it's an expanding itself, then we are applying again, but we're still uh, are waiting for the, the answers. Dr. Kadam, any more left? I think, sir, <clears throat> we have covered majority of the questions. Uh, and we have uh, also read a comment from Dr. Gautam Suresh uh, regarding tele resuscitation. Um, well, Dr. Gabriel, I had one question in your journey over the last four years when you started what were the difficulties and how you have overcome uh, because if you look at if you ask any NICU in the in the country that you need to get a machine for amplitude integrated machine and the cost is something like uh, 14 or 15 lakh rupees it's a huge amount of money um, and then that actually ripples the clinicians in terms of priorit prioritizing the expenses and revenue in buying such an expensive bit of machine so yeah. are there any uh, way forward or, or in getting a economical or a cheaper uh, brain monitoring so that it can be implemented in a much wider scale uh, in the country or all over the world in the lmic without compromising the quality yeah, so that's that's really, really a great question. And actually, these are the barriers that I may say that I face every single day during my last four or five years. Uh, so again, what are the, the main barrier? Of course, you know, during my presentation, I said, oh, I got this brilliant idea. Why should not implement this for everyone? I came direct at that time. <laughs> government, you no, know, we don't have much money. It's difficult to implement something like this. So definitely uh, the resource, the limitation of resources, I may say is the, the largest barrier. And it's tough because, you know, when you come to the clinicians, when you come to, you know, the physicians, the nursing staff, so when you go to conferences and you show that it's important to provide adequate care for these infants, all they say, uh, it's really it's it's really easy to convince the clinicians that you know this is something important but the big thing and and the big step is convincing actually you know the the directors of the hospital uh, and even you know the public centers say okay but why should i invest on this and again uh, i think that the beauty of this kind of project it's this allow us to implement this, this protocols in a lower cost model why why is this lower cost model because again using telemedicine allow us to concentrate the expertise uh, the information, the resources, as more centers get connected to the network, it usually allows, you know, lower costs for the entire model, which is really nice. Uh, also, what we, we face it and we use it, uh, again, is that implementation of the model that the center do not require to buy the equipment because they don't want to, you know, do this initial investment, which is quite huge. And we know these equipments are really expensive. So we try to dilute this in years and years of, you know, of partnership with the centers. But uh, I may say that, you know, uh, also that makes a, a big difference and allow us, you know, uh, to get through these barriers is the commitment of an entire team that truly believes in the importance and the possibility of growth 
of this this project and organization itself. So this requires lots of persistence and hard work because it's never really really easy, you know, to, to start a new center and convince people that they need to invest on in this. And and again, the way to convince uh, the directors of the hostel, the the people who actually have the possibility to implement this in their centers, is trying to show that the economic burden is devastating. So if they invest in here, this makes lots of sense, not only because it's important for the better care, because they are also, you know, uh, saving resources, which is also important. Thank you Thank so you. much. Yes, sir. Any more questions? Shall we? So one last question. Yeah. Uh, can this no novel concept be upscaled to other areas of neonatal care, apart from neonatal neurology? Yes, I completely think so. You know, again, uh, as future directions, we are, we are thinking, you know, using this specialized assistance with uh, consultations from, you know, from team from cardiologists, genetics, infectious disease teams, especially for centers who are not able to have these specialists in their own centers. So why should not you use telemedicine to aid the center somehow? And again, in a lower cost model, I think this definitely can uh, scale to other areas of neonatal care. Fantastic. Um, I, sir, we don't have any more questions. Uh, uh, Ranjan, sir, would you like to make any comment? Um, I would just like to say that it is, it's, an, it's amazing. What you have done is amazing, Dr. Gabriel. Your presentation has been brilliant. Your idea is very innovative. And your progress, which you have made in four to five years, is awesome. So I am sure this is all due to your commitment, dedication, and your hard work. And we really wish you all the best. And a lot of young minds must have thought of a lot of ideas listening to your, uh, uh, your presentation. See, they say that invention is the mother of necessity. So in countries like India, I would say cost-effective inventions and innovations will be the mother and grandmother of all necessities. So we need in our country cost-effective interventions. We need in our country you know, the telemedicine to be used very optimally and achieve what we aspire to achieve. So congratulations once again, and thanks for sharing your uh, presentation experience uh, and your agonies and ecstasies during the journey of four to five years. Um, Dr. Gabriel, it was wonderful. I mean, uh, your original work, your hard work, you know, it inspires, I'm sure, a lot of neonatologists in our country and outside. It has been an inspiring experience and I'm sure this would definitely help a uh, younger generation to do many more things in days to come. Uh, your presentation was excellent and uh, there's one, I think, uh, we wish you all Merry Christmas. And there's one question last, I think, do you provide clinical advice for functional echo PPHN and coagulopathy during uh, cooling? How are you? Yeah. So in first place, I'd like to say thank you so much, Dr. Ranjan. Thanks so much, Dr. Sandeep. This was an amazing session. I feel really, really honored to be part of this webinar series, which is fantastic, as Dr. Ranjan says. You know, the, the, uh, the webinar series itself is becoming legendary. So again, thank you so much. And I think uh, one thing that, you know, 2020 teaches us all that we can collaborate with people across the entire world, you know, this is actually feasible. And uh, I truly think it's really, really important, you know, to collaborate, to share experiences. And we are definitely 100% open to help. I think the knowledge itself, it just works if you can share with people and improve science and help in the end of the day our babies, that is what we want to do. So again, thank you so much if you wanted to, to be part of this session today. And just to, to uh, answer the last question. So uh, we do not, uh, especially in, in uh, PPHN. Yes, so uh, 
actually we help you know conducting uh, the clinical case itself so if you have a severe and critically ill baby so yes we are gonna help for managing pphn coagulopathy uh, during cooling so definitely and actually this becomes a part of our protocol you know or management of these babies with severe hie or during cooling so yes we, we definitely do the training for this and help and, and lively. So many times, you know, people can call our staff and let's discuss the protocol together. Let's discuss this case and think what should we do. Yes. So this is important as well. Yeah. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure I'm, we go home with a lot of knowledge. We go home with a lot of uh, uh, ideas that you have given us. I'm sure they would help our babies in days to come. Thank you very much. And with this, I will hand over the proceedings to Dr. Manoj. We would also like to thank the organizing committee for inv inviting us to moderate this excellent session. Over to you, Dr. Manoj. Yeah, I would like to say thank you so much for Dr. Manoj as well. Thank you so much for the invitation. And their team. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, it's uh, as we also uh, said, all good things need to come to an end. It's time to wind up today's session. So we'll make it very uh, brief. Uh, uh, let me, uh, on behalf of the organizing team, uh, thank uh, Dr. Gabriel for doing a wonderful talk and Dr. Ranjan Pajavar and Dr. Sandeep Kadam for uh, mo moderating this session so well. We are already short past time. Uh, at the, uh, before we wind up, let me also thank the respected delegates. Uh, we are truly honored to have you uh, with us and uh, it's a honor, it's a true honor. Today was the 18th and the last uh, webinar into 2020. We begin 2021 uh, with a practical issue. The a 90, Our 19th webinar will be on 5th January. Uh, on what dogmas in neonatology are in need for change. I would humbly invite all of you to kindly join us for that as well. With that, we say goodbye and uh, see you next year, 2021. Thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye, Manoj. Thank you and Happy New Year. Thank you. Thank you.